Welcome to Iron and Ceramite, Librarius Omnis, where we explore the depths of the Black Library. Hello everyone, um, welcome again uh, to Iron and Ceramite and uh, this in our Librarius Omnis series. Uh, and today we're going over uh, Fulgrim part four. Um, for those of you that have been following, obviously we've, we've gone through the first three parts already. We're now up to part four. Um, it's been a bit of a labor of love, this one, as it, it is such a great book, but there's so much in it um, that it's taken us a while to get through it. I am, of course, as always, joined by John. Hello. And uh, we'll, we'll dive into the book. But first of all, we'll give a bit of a brief recap of parts uh, one through three. Um, and obviously trying to be as quick as possible, given that um, if you want to see the more in-depth videos, um, you can you can go back to the channel and check those out. Um, but where we join uh, the Empress Children and Fulgrim right now is after um, multiple different bits and pieces. So um, when we joined them at the beginning, um, they were battling uh, a Xenos race called the Lair on uh, Laren, um, whilst also introducing us to a, a suite of remembrances, artists, poets, sculptors that were joining the Emperor's Children. Um, after that, um, a successful campaign, although brutal campaign for the Emperor's mm. Children, um, Fulgrim gets his hands on a, uh, a powerful blade that it calls to him, or at least he feels like it calls to him. Um, and there, there's a lot of hints that the, the, the Legion are uh, very much um, about chasing sensation. Um, and that follows, follows them into part two of the book, um, where, we, uh, where we get introduced in a, in a lot more detail to the Iron Hands um, and uh, their, their Primarch. Um, and the the love that uh, both Ferris Manus and Fulgrim kind of share for each other, and this brotherhood that that is has been shared since their first meeting on on Terra, where they challenged each other to to make these massive war weapons, which would then be the weapons that they would go on and carry. Um, and at that point, the uh, the Empress children are there to help the um, Iron Hands uh, prosecute a, a war against the uh, Disparex, I believe it is. Yes. Um, Excellent. I've got that right. And then <laughs> uh, rapidly from there, from another successful engagement that um, is, is on the face of it is incredibly successful, but one that, um, you know, Fulgrim feels that maybe there's uh, his brother's taken some of his glory or, you know, has, has helped him out in ways that he didn't want to be helped. Um, we get to part three and uh, we, we then, we're then introduced to yet another big character in uh, 40k lore, that of uh, Eldred Ulf, uh, um, Ulfran, sorry, Eld Eldred Ulfran, the farseer of the craft world Ulfway. Um, and um, obviously he, he speaks with Fulgrim on uh, one of the many maiden worlds um, that uh, the Emperor's children have come through. Um, and one of the um, one of the things that Eldrad doesn't realize is that um, the that one the humans and the Astartes do not know of chaos. So this is they are not aware of the the, the residents of the warp. Um, and the other thing is he he's not aware um, that that maybe Fulgrim has already fallen or is tainted, um, and particularly tainted by uh, by his sword. Um, and then what proceeds after that is a uh, what, what a really good, especially at this point in the heresy, uh, a really good depiction of a battle um, between the the forces of the Eldar and or Eldari um, and the Astartes and Fulgrim um, having a pretty pretty solid battle um, mm. with with an avatar of Cain. Um, and then from there, we uh, Fulgrim gets his sword back after that battle. As I said, more details in our previous video. Um, and they get back to uh, the fleet. Um, and that's pretty much where we pick up now, I believe. John, you can cover anything that I may have missed there, because that's pretty rapid fire. Yeah, that was a very whistle stop. Made it seem like nothing's happened at all. Um, <laughs> But we ended with Fulgrim releasing the virus bombs onto That's these it. Eldar Maiden worlds to the shock and horror of those that haven't quite been uh, or haven't been tainted or corrupted yet. Um, yeah, but I think you hit everything, all, all the major points. Um, anything that we've missed now, there's already videos of it. So 
I'm sure if you're with us now, uh, you're up to speed. Yeah. Um, but that brings us into part four, Threshold, chapter 16. And we go from the excitement of uh, an Eldar battle with the um, corn beast or cane beast, sorry. Yeah. Uh, and we join now the very exciting ad- emissary from the Administratum of Terror for a bit of politics. Oh, really. Um, so Ormond Braxton has been sent to uh, join the Empress Children. Um, he's obviously um, one of the pen pushers who come out and make sure everyone's fighting the war in the right way. Um, and he's been sent to meet with Fulgrim. Um, but he, since arriving, he's been sort of made to just wait um, and twiddle his thumbs. Yeah. <clears throat> he's... Uh, Described as being a high-ranking official, um, the equal of someone of Sindeman's stature. So quite an important person that even the Primarchs have to sort of um, humour, not necessarily respect. Um, And after a while of waiting, he's essentially been sent up to have a word with Fulgrim about some goings-on that we may or may not have already covered in earlier books. Um, after a couple of days of waiting, he's eventually allowed into Fulgrim's chamber. And obviously the last time he would have seen Fulgrim, Fulgrim would have been the perfect warrior yeah. as everyone would have come to know him. Neat and tidy and artistic and very beautiful looking. Um, but he goes into the chamber and he's absolutely shocked because he's trashed the place. Very similar to how Serena, um, the painter's op- um, studio would have been he's smashed canvases and the statues and there's rotten food that's been untouched all over the place um and just to shock him even more fulgrim's running around almost completely naked just wearing his loincloth and he's also wandering around holding a uh, a silver sword yeah um instead of letting the guy talk he uh, puts his arm Fulgrim comes, greets him, puts his arm around him and walks him down to show him this new painting that he's just uh, collected from uh, Serena. And uh, Braxton's absolutely horrified by what he sees. It's, it's, he calls it an abomination uh, and just sees it's like a twisted version of Fulgrim as, as if uh, someone who wanted to disrespect him had painted it. Mm. Uh, it's absolutely disgusting. Um, and... Fulgrim is in love with this painting like through Fulgrim's eyes it's the best thing he's ever seen um and he said he's going to have it officially un- unveiled in uh Le Fenice during an upcoming performance so everybody's minds are starting to to melt a little bit here yeah uh, you've everyone, got the everyone that's been on the Laren Temple is drinking the same Kool-Aid and it's uh Slanesh flavoured <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, an acquired taste at the minute. <laughs> so Orman, um, he gives him some news of the ongoings uh, and he tells him that uh, Lehman Russ and the wolves have been sent to take Magnus back to Terra to answer for um, continuing to use magic. Um, he tells Fulgrim that Horace um, was severely injured during a fight on Davin mm-hmm. and the Astartes who rescued him um they got back to the, the flagship and members of the Mournville um, killed a number of civilians in their haste to uh, get Horace to um, medical treatment. Mm-hmm. Um, and currently the um, clerks on terror are now demanding um, someone be brought to account, which obviously we had uh, Eldrad telling uh, Fulgrim earlier on that Horace is going to be horribly wounded. And that's sort of what kicked off the war um, or kicked off that battle because yep. he said that now Horace is wounded, he's going to fall to chaos. He's going to be turned. Um, and it's just showing visions of what he was told and now coming to light. Um, and obviously he's just told him that they want to bring the uh, Astartes to justice for killing these civilians and Fulgrim, rounds on Orman in fury and raises his sword and actually makes Orman uh, piss himself <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, back down and Fulgrim apologises and he says, I'll go to Horace um, and check on the Legion and make sure they're fighting the war in the right way. Yep. Um, 
and he tells Orman to leave and not worry about it. And as all Orman's walking out, he can hear Fulgrim arguing with somebody, and he sneaks a peek behind him and sees that uh, Fulgrim is shouting and, and talking to the painting. Uh, so Fulgrim has well and truly uh, lost it here, I think. Yeah. Uh, then we go to uh, Serena, who last time we saw her, she had taken to killing um, for her art and she killed the poet Leopold. Um, and now she's, by this point, she's killed a few more people and she's been using their remains. Anything that comes out of a person, she's been using that to paint. Um probably some of which has made it onto Fulgrim's new uh, portrait. Absolutely. And she's standing over the body of, of another victim uh, and Lucius walks in to her study and sees the, the dead man on the floor. And he asks her what happened and she says that this guy tried to rape her and she was able to fight him off and kill him. Uh, and Lucius doesn't question it. He just says, oh, bastard deserved it then. <laughs> and just takes her word for it. Um, and he says he will get servitors up to clean the body away and keep it secret. And it's quite interesting because it's just so noticed that even though she's grateful for um, Lucius being discreet and just accepting it, she also says that she actually secretly despises him for this, mm. which I think the the bit at the back of her mind that hasn't quite snapped yet, probably trying to push through or show her that maybe she's not doing the right thing. Uh, so as they're talking, she then picks up her um, her knife and cuts her cheek, yep. uh, which Lucius, Lucius questions. And she says, it's so she'll never forget what happened to her. Um, and while he's thinking, he's rubbing his nose, which uh, Garvel Loken broke during their little uh, training fight. Yeah. Um, and he tells her about it. And she says, well, your uh, perfect face has already been ruined <laughs> and basically hands him the knife. And then in turn, he cuts himself across both cheeks. Uh, and as we know from reading uh, like uh, Galaxy and Flames, especially every time Loken, uh, every time uh, Lucius turned up, his face was a little bit more scarred every time. Yeah. Uh, so it's quite a nice little um, five books later. And we finally find out sort of what's going on with him. And how that all started, um, which is a nice sort of arc to to catch up with. It's a good callback, isn't it? It's uh, yeah. yeah, it's definitely um, interesting um, to see where that started, um, because as I said, from that point on, you know, the, the I mean, obviously, you could argue that the perfect form of uh, Lucius was was ruined by uh, Loken, um, but from this point on, it's definitely it's definitely gone. Um, yeah. Like from now on, it's just every scar is a different, um, a different tale. Yeah, and just to uh, sort of drive it back home, like we've mentioned a few times, he hasn't been tainted as far as we know yet. Yeah, he, he's just a bit psychotic. Um, he's like, or what was it you said last time? Some people are just dicks. <laughs> yes, that, that's um, exactly it. Yeah. Uh, so back, back in his chamber, Fulgrim's still arguing with the painting um, and, it, and it's talking back to him and he's seeing it talk to him like looking into a, a mirror um, and Fulgrim, in his mind, he, he questions it. But as soon as the question comes up, it's pushed back down um, and he just accepts it as normal. Um, and then a feeling of elation is replaced with any doubt uh, or replaced by the doubt. Mm. Um, the painting then tells him that Horus is turning traitor um, and Fulgrim tries to argue but it tells him that Fulgrim wouldn't fare any better in those circumstances Horus is the most worthy and he's falling so what does that tell you yeah. um, and the demon then introduces itself and calls itself the spirit of perfection which obviously screams out to Fulgrim's previous desires anyway yeah um, and, and it convinces him that Horus is doing the right thing. The right thing would to be to turn on the Emperor. Um, he's got no more use for the Primarchs now. He's gone back to Terra. He's on the path to becoming a god himself. Um, and the Primarchs are just going to be completely useless to him. And yeah. it tells him that he should join Horus because 
Horace is now going to fight for perfection. Um, uh, <clears throat> and Fulgrim accepts it and they carry on making their way um, to Horace. Uh, and whilst they're on route, we join Marius, who's now strapped onto the tabletop of Fabius Bile. Um, and he is willingly there. Uh, he's probably the first one who's gone, who's not under any influence. Um, yeah, of course. Uh, who's gone willingly, isn't he? Yeah, because I- Eidolon obviously um, wanted to be the first, um, but for different reasons than the others. Yeah. Um, Julius Caceron, um was obviously on the atoll, so he he he's drinking the Kool Aid. Mm-hmm. Um, Solomon uh, Demeter wants nothing to do with it at this point, and uh, yeah. Sol Tarvitz won't have anything to do with it. And Lucius hasn't had his moment yet either, has he? So it's um, no. It is now uh, like Mar- as you said, Marius Verosian, who is still on the. Um, he may not be untainted, but he he wants to be on the Kool Aid because he wants to do whatever he's told basically yeah because he needs to be perfect because he doesn't want to let daddy down Mm -hmm. um so uh nine weeks later um the emperor's children reunite with horus and his legion um all of fulgrim's injuries are now healed from um fighting the eldar yep um and he's sort of been trapped on the ship so he hasn't needed his weaponry as much and he's felt that his, his head's been clearer without the sword but he can't bring himself to, to dispose of it um, and just keeps hold of it anyway out of comfort um, and as they're approaching he realises that they haven't actually been intercepted or even noticed by Horace's fleet so he then tells his fleet to go into um covert mode and yeah. mute radio communications and they're going to sneak up uh, and surprise Horace but as they're creeping up um, the voice in his head is telling him that he should just start wiping Horace's fleet out <laughs> um, but it's interesting to think is this the voice of the demon saying wipe Horace out because it's evil and, or is it the part of Mag- uh, the part of uh, Fulgrim thinking He's turning traitor. This is my chance to. Yeah. Because he hasn't had the sword. He's, his mind's clearer because he hasn't been holding onto that sword. It's interesting, is it? Because he, he kind of has that moment where it's kind of he just sort of thinks about how he could do it um, and how sort of easy it would be. And he's got the firing solutions and he's he's good to go. Yeah. Um, but for whatever reason, he he obviously doesn't. Um, and I, I really think because because he hasn't had the sword, I think that he would have done it because, and maybe things would have gone better for it because it's at this point that Eidolon arrives and hands him the sword mm-hmm. um, as the, the thought's going through his head and Fulgrim puts it to his waist. And although he doesn't remember asking for the sword, he just accepts it. Yeah. Um, and then the desire to attack Horus leaves him. So I, I really sort of think there's definitely uh that sword realised what was going through his mind. Um, I don't know how Eidolon decided to bring it to him, but lucky that he did, I guess. Yeah. Or, or unlucky. It depends what side you're on. <laughs> um, so, as we know, um, Fulgrim then goes to the Vengeful Spirit and takes with him Eidolon, um, Tarvitz, Lucius and Fabius. Um, he takes Eidolon because he's already worked with um, the now Lunar Wolves and um, as a representative, he takes Lucius and Sol because they're friends with part of the Mournville, and it's always good to take um, friendly faces with you for morale. Um, yeah. but he can't put his finger on why he's asked Fabius to come with him. He just knows that he has, but he can't, he can't remember why. Um, and Fulgrim and Horace then greet each other, uh, and Fulgrim then tells Horace that uh, Lehman Russ is on his way to take Magnus to the Emperor, um, which sort of ties into the scenes that we've already seen uh, previously. Um, they then go to Horace's chamber. They dismiss their men um, to go their separate ways. And Horace um, takes Fulgrim into his chamber and introduces him to Erebus, um, which is obviously 
surprising to Fulgrim that uh, he would go into a Primarch's meeting and, and there's another Astartes there, not even one of his own legion, uh, yeah. just another um, another bod. Just a word word bearer chaplain. Um, yeah. Like, and he's not even of the Lunar Wards. So it's like, what? Who? who's this guy? What's he's quite dismissive of him, which is quite interesting for Erebus because actually... He's he's he. A lot of people are quite dismissive of him, other than um, Horace, uh, and a lot of a lot of books, like a lot of the yeah. other stories that you've seen so far. Like a lot of people would tend to be a bit dismissive of him to begin with, and then he he kind of worms his way in there. Mm. So yeah, it's another another moment where <laughs> even though Fulgrim is, uh, you know, he's he's primed and good to fall. Um, He's not necessarily good and primed to fall based on uh, the word of Erebus. No, it's probably his plan, really, isn't it? He's generally, I mean, it's worked with Horace for a couple of reasons, but I suppose he's there more to um, meet the men at his level because mm. got half the Mournerville accepted him and then the, the Warrior Lodge brought him in. Um, and that's more his level, isn't it? Yeah. And then... Don't worry about the doubters because he'll find enough the right he'll find his right people to turn. They then start talking about Horus, who's allowing Angron to wage a bloody war on the planet below to ensure yeah. his loyalty to Horus. There, uh, at this point, they are fighting the um, Ortian technocracy, um, who they've started this war after they went back um, to um, make a peace with them. And then Horus executed the um, ambassador under the guise of an assass- assassination attempt on his own life, yep. which has started this war, um, which he obviously wanted. Um, and Angon's down there trying to get into the Iron Fortress and um, and Horus is allowing him to do it. Uh, so Horus and Erebus then spend three whole days explaining the events to Fulgrim himself about what... Yep led up to this point uh, and up to and beyond Horace's injury. Uh, and then while Horace was injured, um, he had his eyes opened to the lies told by the emperor. Um, and Horace tells Fulgrim of all the lies and deceit um, that Fulgrim just doesn't accept immediately, even though he's been told all this stuff um, by Eldrad and, the paintings told him as well. He just can't accept that this is the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, Horace then shows him copies of the uh, Lectitio uh, Divinatus. Yeah. Um, and tells him that mortals on the ship um, are calling the Emperor of God, um, which and he's telling them that obviously the Emperor didn't want this, but it's convenient that now all these mortals are now turning back to. Uh, look to Terran to look to the Emperor who's gone back on his secret mission um, and obviously Horace has been told that he wants to become a god and he started drawing conclusions yeah. um, and Fulgrim finally submits um, and asks Horace what he should do and, and finally um, this is uh, Fulgrim's official turn I guess um, to heresy um, they part ways then um, after um, Fabius Bile turns up at some point during the, the talks um, yeah. with a special sword for Fulgrim. Um, and uh, yeah, after that, then they they they, they part ways. Um, the Emperor's Hor- shield... Yeah. Horus gifts him the uh, the anaphame, doesn't he? So that's the anaphame yeah. that struck him low. He's, he's given it over to Fulgrim as like a um, uh, a token of trust. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's Fulgrim's love and trust for um Horace that allows the, the the whole fall in the first place because he's like he can't not believe you know like his trusted brother and the best of them um would fall unless it was for you know the pursuit of perfection or the um you know the the the, the well, exactly that is is that pursuit yeah. of perfection and getting humanity back there um, and because that's what Horace, not Horace, a Fulgrim craves more than anything, um, he he's convinced that only the Chaos Gods can provide that. Um, yeah. And I think he's not like he is. He is now fully in, but it takes a while to convince him. And he definitely shoots Erebus a few harsh words during that con- convincing session. 
like you know who who is this person to talk to me like you know who is he to tell all of these lies and stuff like that and then it's only yeah. after like horror essentially almost backs up Erebus that Fulgrim starts to listen and then that's that yeah he sort of he accepts it doesn't he he Horace talks for him or he talks for me his word is as good as mine accept yeah. it yeah and that and that gets him on um <clears throat> so after their short visit the Empress children travel to the uh Caledine system um which is being invaded by orcs um and they're there to help the iron hands take back control of this system um we join um uh, Solomon and Gaius on board mm. an orbital station. They've gone as a squad of uh, 30 um, to try and take back this um, station and they're just being completely overwhelmed by orcs. Uh, there's so many that uh, um, they're, they're losing men left, right and centre um, and they're waiting for Julius and Marius to yep. send reinforcements um, which are long overdue by this point. Um, and the orcs uh, starting to charge um, and whittle down the Empress children um, and Solomon gets taken off his feet by uh, a number of orcs um, and he is literally seconds away from being murdered and then he just hears more gunfire and the orcs start to drop um, and as he gets up um, he looks to find Julius or Marius but instead he sees uh, Sol Tarvitz and Lucius yeah, um, which was not the plan. No, um, it, it's. I was going to say it's not clear at this point either because obviously the the Emperor's children fleet is split, mm. um, with some of them going to Istvan, and no, not yet. <laughs> Does that not happen yet? I, have, I think it literally happens after this battle. Oh, okay, fine. It literally right, happens right. in a minute. Um, okay, because Tarvitz obviously he's the one going to Istvan. Oh, of course, yeah, he ends up at Istvan, um, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, but. Yeah. So you're, you're yeah. right. You're right. We're still in the Kalanidis uh, sector. Um, yeah. The orcs are still there. I, d- um, I can't remember though. Did did Ferris actually request this assistance? I don't think he did. This is just Fulgrim's going to help him, un- and that's the guys he uses to go and talk to him. Yeah, pretty much. Um, um, yeah, that the, they've got. I think I don't know whether they went to help anyway, like before. Mm. Um, but he's just yo-yoing, isn't he, between um, Horus and Ferris Manis at yeah. this point. Um, um, so yeah, so uh, Solomon gets up and says, Oh, where's uh, Solomon? Uh, where's uh, sorry, where's Julius and, and um, Marius? Marius and Tarvis says he doesn't know where the other companies are. Um, but they heard the distress signal uh, and dropped in. Um, but they had to go uh, and get back on with their own mission. Yeah. And as he goes, Solomon wonders, Why didn't the backup come? It was there, they they knew what was going on, they were yeah. supposed to be here. Um, and at this point, Solomon's not the only one who knows that something weird is happening. Um, Vespasian, um, he goes to visit Fulgrim. He's um, been noticing a decline in the state of his legion very mm-hmm. recently. Um, and it's getting worse and worse. With It's just becoming, I guess, a pigsty. And the art has taken a turn. And this beautifully kept ship is clearly turning into a hellhole. Yeah. The men are not how they should be acting. Um, And he has been trying to get Fulgrim's ear for uh, weeks, but he's been getting um, just battered off and denied. And considering he is literally um, second in command or tied second in command with Eidolon, he should be able to walk into Fulgrim's chamber whenever he wants, but he just hasn't been able to get in there. Um, But he's witnessed um, from the command station, Solomon, um, squad being left basically to die um, so he barges into uh, Fulgrim's chamber and as we know from before Fulgrim's been carving the statues of his um, captains, captains. Um, and as he goes in he sees that the statue of Solomon is smashed um, to pieces but he also notices that Fulgrim's carrying three swords which is new to him um, and he says why did you leave um, Solomon to die? Um, you're lucky that he was rescued by Sal and Lucius. Yeah. Um, and Fulgrim doesn't give too much away, but he's not happy that Solomon's still alive. Um, and we go, and we go back to the, this, this is the bit where you go, 
and you realise that the only reason he's potentially put Solomon in this position is because he beat him to the bridge um, yeah. the last time round um, when they were when they were fighting the the disparate disparates, um, and that's that's the level of um, the level that Fulgrim's dropped to now. He's he's throwing yeah. him away uh, because of what he sees as um, slights against his character. Yeah. And uh, it doesn't bode well for Sal and Lucius now because they've been name dropped as Solomon <laughs> Saviors. <laughs> so we know where they're going next. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, Vespasian um, demands to know what's going on. And Fulgrim starts rambling about purging uh, the Legion of Unworthy. Yeah. Uh, and tells him about plans to go to Istvan. And he's just rambling. And Vespasian can't work out what he's talking about. Um, and Fulgrim, similar to what he did with uh, Braxton earlier, puts his arm around Fulgrim and guides him over to the painting and tells him to look at it. And Vespasian looks in at this horror um, and is completely transfixed and locks eyes with this demon inside the painting. Mm. Uh, and a voice is demanding that he gives himself over, but Vespasian's actually strength of character um, manages to resist. Um, he, he doesn't have any you know, desires for power. He's obviously where he is. He, he knows that that's the limit and he's a good soldier um, and doesn't want anything else um, and resists this painting. Yeah. And the painting tells Fulgrim that he's no good uh, and to kill him. And Fulgrim then says his name, says Vespasian. Um, and at this point, the Amophane springs to life and Vespasian's paralyzed by a um, sharp pain in his back and Fulgrim then uses the Amophane and drives it down his back through his spine and, and just leaves him there to die. Um, which is brutal. mad, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> like... G- given that this is a Lord commander of the, uh, the emperor's children, um, you know, who, who I was going to say several books ago, it's not several books ago at the start of this book was like one of the most, you know, uh, sort of celebrated and respected and followed, Astartes on the Great Crusade, and now yeah. he's he's become a a scabbard for the uh, for the anaphone. <laughs> yeah, like, it's it's not a good way to go. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, we didn't really get a lot out of him either. We got one fight scene against the Eldar. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, he obviously uh, had some potential there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's uh, a shame. like like you know. He, the, the, the brief moments we got, like with him chatting with Solomon and stuff like that, you think to yourself, well, maybe maybe there's a bit of character here. Um, but, unfortunately, you know, it's a shame they can't go into him more. Um, but I suppose, unfortunately, this 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 book is about the um, the fall from grace and excesses of the chapter, as opposed yeah. to the uh, the few noble, um, noble Astartes still at its heart. Mm. And it's taken. Of which they were getting fewer. <laughs> yeah. Well, it took him a long time to do anything, though, didn't it? I mean, he, he just, like we've, a few um, people have said, um, just stand on the sidelines. He He's didn't let a lot of it happen, didn't he? Yeah. He, I mean, he watched so much. Like, he, did, he didn't really raise an eyebrow about these virus bombs. Um, I know he questioned it, but mm. he still did it. And it's taken him this, this long for him to finally step up. He could have maybe intervened earlier. Yeah. Uh, well, but he didn't, and he's dead. So let's move yeah. on. <laughs> um, so Fulgrim goes then to the orbital station. Um, now that the orcs have been defeated, um, and he is accompanied by his new inner circle of Idlon, um, Fabius Bile, and the chaplain um, Charmosian. Yeah. Um, who have been instrumental in spreading new uh, orders throughout the. Um, um, Legion and obviously selecting the good men um, and this is where he tells the Legion that once again they will be divided yeah. um, the majority will return to Istvan to fight alongside Horus and the War Master along with the Death Guard and the World Eaters mm-hmm. um, and the rest will remain with Fulgrim to fight the Orcs and visit um, Ferris Manis um, and this is obviously where um, Tarvitz and Lucius and Eidolon um, are going to go back the way they came, back yep. to Istvan, 
Uh, but we're going to stick here with uh, Fulgrim. Um, and we're, go, we're going to go visit uh, Ferris Manus now. Indeed. Who's keenly awaiting his arrival. Um, and he's regretting the way they parted before. Yep. Um, he knew uh, Fulgrim was upset. He's not completely sure why, because he obviously saved his Firebird from being blown up um, and feels like maybe he might have scuppered his honour. Um, but he's keen to see his brother again and, and make up for it. Yeah. Um, and like you said earlier, he's not sure why Fulgrim is coming. He didn't request support this time, um, as with the Disparax, but he's looking forward to uh, seeing his brother and uh, fighting some orcs. <clears throat> um, so Fulgrim arrives with Julius and 10 of his newly appointed Phoenix Guard, because obviously... Yep. The old Phoenix Guard got killed um, by the Eldar. Yeah. Um, and they enter the Anvuarium and, and greet Fulgrim and Captain Santar and um, 10 of Ferris Manus's Morlocks, which I guess are his Terminators, essentially. They are his, they're, they're his Terminator Guard, yeah. So it, it seems to be that all of like the, um, the Primarch's main guards in almost every chapter or Legion um, are effectively Terminators, or they, they're the ones that get the first set of Terminator gear. It's the same as um, in the Lunar Wars uh, with the, the Just Aaron that's led by um, uh, Ezekiel uh, yeah. Abaddon. Um, and I I would imagine, like, well, no, because it was in the Emperor's Children. Who was it that had the first set? Was it Julius that had Julius, uh, yeah, because he yeah. says that he wishes they had more. So I don't know if the Phoenix Guard also rock it, but um, I don't certainly know. in this case, the Morlocks um, are, 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 yeah, all, all yeah. Terminator. They're, they're all covered in Terminator armor. If they're not in Terminator armor, they must be in something pretty good to be yeah. Phoenix Guard. Yeah. Um, so they, um, Ferris Manus and Fulgrim embrace uh, and they go off to Ferris Manus's chamber um, to talk about the future. Um and the Empress children and the um, Iron Hands line up uniform, one next to the other, um, with the captains next to each other. Um, and it's noted that um, Fulgrim has ditched the uh, silver lair sword mm -hmm. and brought his um, fireblade with him uh, for this meeting. Um, back on the uh, Pride of the Emperor, Marius has been left in command upon the flagship. Um, and most of his men now have been through and had the surgery um, and the injections of Fabius Bile, um, and Marius's senses are now in overdrive, yeah. um, and he's just tingling. He's ready for something to go wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, he, he can't wait, uh, and he's got the Empress Children's fleet. Um, he's mingling around the Iron Hand's fleet, um, and he's just waiting to hear um, from Fulgrim. Um, Fulgrim asks Ferris Manus when the last time he saw the Emperor was. Um, and I think for the majority of them, when Horus was named War Master, that was on, I can't remember the name of the planet. Uh, Ulanor. Ulanor. So after like the Orc campaign, I guess. Yeah, well, they, they brought down like the, 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 at that point, the greatest war that, um, the, the Crusades had seen and it was mm. uh, finished on Ulanor and uh, or Ulanor. Yeah. And they weren't all there. No. Um, but most of them were. <laughs> yeah. So that was when the Emperor told them they were going back to Terra. So uh, Ferris Manis wasn't there. Uh, he was on a separate campaign. Um, so he said it was way before uh, Fulgrim last in him. Mm. Um which is interesting because he doesn't feel any resentment about it. He wasn't there. He's just been carrying on, like we discussed earlier. He's just a good soldier getting yep. on with it. Um, and then Fulgrim tells him that the Emperor abandoned them uh, and then starts spilling the beans that says that uh, Horus told him that the Emperor is back on terror, working towards becoming a god. Yeah, um, uh, trying to achieve his uh, apophysis. Apoph yeah. Apophysis, yeah. Um, and or becoming a god. He upsets Ferris Manus now, um, and they both get quite heated. Um, Fulgrim tells him that others have already pledged to join uh, Horus, including the Mechanicum, yeah. have already uh, sworn to him. And 
Ferris Manus tells him that this is a betrayal uh, for all they stand for. This is not what they set out to do. And uh, Fulgrim tries to beg Ferris Manus to join him for the sake of their brotherhood, for yeah. the sake of everything they have. And and Ferris Manus tells them that um, our brotherhood died when you turned traitor. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's not taking any, any any guff on this. It's uh, it's pretty cut and dry for Ferris. Yeah. Um, you know, you, if you get, you're, you're with me or you're against me. And uh, yeah, he he is not going to... For him, it's a, it's a case of honour. Yeah, um, definitely. And he, he there's no way that he, he's going to go against the Emperor. No. Um, Fulgrim tells him that uh, Lorgar, Angon and Mortarian have already um, sworn um, and things will be in place um, and begs him to yeah. join before he gets destroyed. Um, and uh, Ferris Manus lifts up Forgebreaker and tells Forgrim that he's going to destroy him. Yep. Uh, and unfortunately for them, now everything's over between them and they fight. Um, and Fulgrim can sense that as angry as Ferris Manus is, is actually just as sad. Yeah. Um, clearly doesn't want to be doing this, but pride and honour... Um, and and his word, I guess, trump anything else. That's it. He's got to take Fulgrim out and hopefully uh, squash the uh, the heresy, the uh, the traitors before they before they even get going. Yeah. Um, while they're fighting, um, Fulgrim's telling him that Horus is already planning to purge the legions on Istavan. Um, he's going to unleash the virus bomb on those deemed uh, loyal to the emperor. Yeah. Um, and Fulgrim is just stunned by like, the horror of it. Um, and Fulgrim is able to leap at him and get a, um, an upper hand and cuts Ferris Manus across the face yeah. um, quite severely and goes in for a killing blow. But Ferris manages, grabs hold of the sword because he's obviously got his um, iron hands. Necrodermis. Um, necrodermis. And grabs this sword and causes it to explode, which, yeah. um, although it puts, uh, it blows them both onto their asses, and uh, I think it really um, does them both some damage, especially uh, Ferris Manus. Um, Fulgrim's able to get to his feet, and he picks up um, Forge Breaker and asks his brother why he wouldn't just join. Mm. Um, and Fulgrim tells him that he's not his brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, or Fer- Ferris tells him he's not his brother. Yeah, sorry, Ferris says, um, you're not my brother. Yeah. Um, and Fulgrim says, you'll always be my brother, and then hits him across the face with uh, the, the hammer, knocking him unconscious. Fra- fracturing his skull. It's like, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's a pretty meaty blow, but even though the uh, the demon inside him wants, wants uh, Ferris Manus gone, um, yeah. Fulgrim still pulls himself back just just enough not to not to actually kill him. Yeah. Uh, and he walks out holding Forgebreaker. So he, he's taken that back now. Yeah. Uh, his gift. Um, and as he walks out holding it, Julius uh, sees uh, Fulgrim exit in and gives an order. And the Phoenix Guard, without hesitating, in sync, um, basically withdraw their swords and behead the Morlocks stood next yep. to them. Um, which stuns uh, Captain Santar and as he's trying to figure out what's happening, Julius is, um, plunges his power claw into his chest and just rips him from uh, chest down. Yeah, he really messes him up. <laughs> <laughs> does not sound particularly pleasant. No. Uh, but he doesn't now, die. He doesn't die. No, no, he doesn't, which is amazing. Given that it's a power claw that's ripped through a lot of him, that's normally that would be uh, that would be game over. Game over. But um, yeah. not he in must this have instance. he must have missed both his hearts. Yes. Yeah. But everything uh, else would have got mangled. Yeah. Um, and then Marius gets what he wanted. Um, he gets the order to attack, and because uh, the Empress' children intermingled with uh, the Iron Hands. They're in a really good position to just cause chaos. Yeah. Uh, um, and then they, they flee. Um, they absolutely devastate the Iron Hands. They don't wipe them out. No. Which they, they cripple baffling, them, basically. Yeah. So they uh, the, the Surprise Act cripples them so that 
whilst it's happening, obviously Fulgrim can get away on Firebird or can get back to to the main fleet on Firebird and also allows the entire Third Legion to, or the Emperor's Children, to flee into the warp and get back. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing, because it's not the full fleet, um, because it's just a... You know, a chunk of them. Oh, yeah. most most of them are already gone, aren't they? That yeah. maybe it's just the smaller ships, and that's why they're intermingled in the the Iron Hands fleet, and they just kind of yeah the ships and then disappear. Yeah, um, that makes sense. But there's still something about it because obviously Fulgrim didn't want to kill Ferris, even though he could have done. He didn't kill him, mm. um, and you know maybe it's maybe it's plot armor, but but I, I guess as well it's because he didn't take. The lair sword he took. He took Fireblade. Fire, yeah. Fireblade. So, whereas when he was sneaking up on Horus, he was going to blow him out the sky or out mm. of space, and then got the sword and changed his mind. Here, he should have killed him, but because he didn't take the sword, he didn't have that voice. Yeah, the the, the, the demon to... demon's not quite got enough of him yet to force no. him to do. Because uh, as I said, that develops. Um, yeah, the next time they meet, obviously. Yeah, um, so on the surface, it's silly mistakes, but actually, if you think about it, it's it's all to do with that sword. Yeah, um, the sword and the sword and the painting, and the painting, yeah, lovely so painting. It was the sword. It's now the sword and the painting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so they then make their way um, to go and rejoin Horus, um, but they get uh, stuck in some warp storms, which just kill off. Um, a ridiculous amount of it, or oh, I think all of their astropaths, oh, yeah. um, causing uh, a bit of a delay. And it sort of said now that the the legion is completely just falling into decadent ways. That's it. Um, oh, yeah. I think with Fulgrim now, anybody with Fulgrim that wasn't loyal to Fulgrim is dead, probably, um, or the good majority of them anyway. Uh, and this has turned more of a party bus than an actual warship. Yeah. Um, and the news is reaching them now that the purge on Istvan didn't go as planned and yeah. Horus is waging war on the survivors. So um, forest bomb has happened and back on Istvan we've got um, Tarvitz and Lokin fighting the good fight and uh, Fulgrim's on his way to put an end to that. That's it. Uh, Ostian, um, he, since seeing um, Serena and not enjoying what happened to her um, and the state of um, Lefanis last time he was there, he has now locked himself away in his studio yep. um, and has been there for a couple of weeks. And he's just finished um, the work on his statue. Um, and he's thinking to himself, I can't wait. I'll get this statue where it needs to go and I'm out of here. I'm, yep. I'm getting this expedition. Space traveling is not for me. Um, let me off. It's, a, it's all gone uh, a bit bonkers. Yeah. Um, and then we um, join. So now we leave um, um, the Emperor's children uh, on um, the pride of the Emperor. Yeah. And we go to Istvan Free and join Solomon. Uh, he and Gaius were on the planet when the virus bomb went off and the firestorm. He and Gaius were able to protect themselves from the uh, virus bomb mm -hmm. um, inside a bunker. But when the firestorm happened, it exploded, trapping and wounding them both. Uh, and sadly, uh, after three days, Gaius um, passed away. He's come to um, his wounds, didn't he? Yeah, which is a bit of a shame because uh, he was another good side character, like another... Friends yeah. of Solomon, um, who obviously, before all this went wrong, when Solomon was injured, he stepped up and took command. So he had a, had a future. Um, yeah, he did have one. Um, <laughs> and Solomon is saved by a lunar wolf by the name of Nero Vipus, um, another good warrior that we've met before. A name that's familiar, yeah. Um, Solomon was clinging to life, uh, and Nero managed to... Uh, get him up and, and get him get him some help. Um, and then we find out that the flight the fighting has been going on for about a month mm -hmm. uh, and Solomon's just back on his feet now. Um, 
back into fight and shape. He's tied up with uh, Tarvitz's squad. Uh, I think they're in the fortress now, um, clinging on. And Tarvitz has offered to give back command um, to Solomon because he's the ranking officer. Yeah. Um, but Solomon's been so impressed um, that Tarvitz has managed to rally these survivors and has taken yeah. command. And he's not a line officer, is he? He is a commander. Um, and he lets Tarvitz carry on because he's ruined now. Like he, he's pretty injured. Um, yeah, he's, he's, like, let... he's only just able to kind of get himself combat ready, as it were. And yeah. even then, it's pretty, pretty hit and miss. And he also knows, I think there's a bit where he talks about, or it talks about, like he kind of knows that this is, you know, they're all going to die here anyway because they're yeah. they're effectively abandoned on a planet, and all they're all they're trying to do is hold out for as long as possible to delay the traitors. Um, yeah. And so he doesn't want to take command away from him in in like his, his final glory. Team. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and Solomon's also impressed with Lucius because um, he's wandering around with the helmet of. Uh, Chaplain Charmosian. Yeah. <laughs> Good <laughs> and, old Lucius. Good old Yeah. <laughs> so Solomon leaving um, Tarvitz uh, to do his thing. He's patrolling the defences, checking on the men, um, and he is fighting um, coming from one side of the fortress. Um, and he gets there just in time to see um, some traitor Emperor's children surrounding Lucius. Um, and Lucius shouts to help him because they're breaking in. And without thinking, Solomon dives in to Lucius's aid and they are able to kill, I think, the attackers. It's about a squad of 30 or so. It's something like that. It's, 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 a, it's a squad that's, uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, it's a good sized squad. Yeah. And uh, Lucius thanks him for his help. Uh, he And Solomon says, well, how come is, you was, we were overwhelmed, but why did they only send this many they should have sent more Uh, and he's looking around at the bodies trying to um, work out the loyalists from the traitors and see if he can recognise anybody and then he starts to sort of creep and doubt come into his mind the penny penny starts to drop Yeah, and uh, Lucius tells him that he's been uh, clear in space um, ready for Eidolon to arrive um, because Lucius is going to rejoin the legion and and reclaim his honour and the horror <laughs> that must wash over Solomon at this point. Had um, everything he's been through, like near oh. to death, coming back out of it, surviving, getting ready to take out, like, you know, fight for as long as he can. And then, you know, he runs over to aid Lucius in, in what he thinks oh. is, uh, you know, like, I'm going to help him. I'm going to save him. Like, we can do this together, me and him. Yeah, and you just you know, I can see Lucy's face smiling and laughing at him, <laughs> and you he, can just feel it. He's yeah. Solomon has been. He was the first one to say to Fulgrim, "No, this is wrong." He's the, the only one really in the Empress Children resisting, fully yeah. resisting, um, and then he's just killed thirty odd loyal brothers, loyal, loyal, loyal um, Empress Children, which is absolutely horrendous and. He dives at Lucius and starts choking him. Yeah. Uh, and as he's choking him out, Lucius um, stabs him through the stomach uh, and drops him to the floor. And he he just walks out. Uh, and Solomon's quite glad to be left alone. And he's watching the sky. Um, and he gets to die alone. Yeah. Um, and starting this book, that is not how I imagine Solomon going out. Like, I, th- what? <laughs> I think the thing is, you, it's the, the same as me. You start all of these books thinking like there'll be some heroic moment for the good guys at some point. And you start to realise, especially maybe, I don't know whether it changes, but all of the you know, good guys are bad guys, but all of the good guys, all of these characters that you build up and you think, like, yeah, I love this guy. They all just end up getting <sighs> like killed. Like really, like, you know, all as far as, you know, like, you're just like, oh man, like Solomon, like you just you want him to get like get his and like feel good for yeah. him, and then he's gone for all of this. He's like, you know, the gods of war are going to look after me, and then finally he gets stabbed in the guts by Lucius, and then not even killed in battle, just left to die. Uh, yeah, after and killing twenty odd of his mates, and it's like, I know that's harsh. <laughs> <laughs> he just didn't get like. 
at least if he died fighting off 30 traitors, it would have been acceptable. Yeah. But it's just horrendous. Well, normally you talk about like a character arc and like, you know, you've, you've got a nice even loop about how it goes and stuff like that. There's no arc here. It, it kind of goes up for a bit and then it just careens off a cliff. It's, yeah. Uh, it's not the end you'd want for him. And it's really, yeah. it's really sad. <laughs> it is. And do you know what? I remember, because I remember the first time I read it and I thought, oh, that, that's absolutely horrendous. Yeah. But because then I went and plowed on with the next few books. Obviously, the names all start mixing up. So when I was reading this again, I thought, like, oh, somebody, somebody at the end of this gets killed. But I know they helped Lucius and die. But I couldn't remember who it was. And as I got, literally, as I got back to this chapter, and Solomon joins. I was like, "Oh no, it's not Solomon, is it? I hope it's not." Because yeah. second time around, like, made a bit more of a connection with him as well. Um, so yeah, it's absolutely horrendous way to go. Good storytelling, though. Oh yeah, very very good. <laughs> it, as I said, <laughs> if, it, if it makes you feel sad, then they've done they've done well, right? Like as yeah. I said, to feel sad about it means that they've made you feel. So the the writing yeah. is good. Yeah, uh, and then so we end now. Um, this part um, Fulgrim finally makes it back and he tells Horace that Ferris Manis refused to join him Yeah. Um, and obviously we've seen their discussion in a uh, previous book um, and Horace is obviously pissed off with him and he tells Fulgrim that you're going to go to Istvan 5 and you're going to prepare uh, for my next phase yeah. and that, that brings us to the end um, there we a go. lot to digest there um, yeah, really is like, um, it's, there's, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff moving forward. Um, obviously you've there's a lot of crossover with the other books now, um, because you've got the events of Istvan Free, you've got Lucius and like, I can't remember which one of the books it is, but you hear it from the other side where he, he fights, uh, Chaplain Charles Mosey and, um, is it on top of the Rhino or whatever it is? Yeah, it's on top of uh, the Land Raider or something like that. Land Raider, yeah. Yeah. That's Galaxy and Flames, I want to say. Yeah, and at that point, you're still like, you know, you know the Charmosian side of it. You know Lucius hasn't hasn't turned yet, but reading this book, you know he does. Yeah. So when you start reading that bit about the... um, Because I think it is in Galaxy and Flames. You don't know it's Solomon. No, you don't, no. You You just hear, you know, like, Lucius, you know, basically has a sword fight with a load of uh, loyalists and then lets uh, the traitors in. Whereas you hear yeah. it this way round and you're like, maybe the way it's in Galaxy and Flames is you're just, you're left, little details are left out and you just think it's because of how good he is as a swordsman. And yeah. then you get to this one and you're like, oh, actually, no, it wasn't that. He actually, you know, whether he, whether he could have done anyway, but it's the fact that he tricked Solomon into killing some of them for him and it's like that's brutal <laughs> is that yeah he's he and that, and this is the thing isn't it like he didn't like solomon because no Sol- solomon looked down on him or, or talked down on him about the the events on murder so this is his snarky little revenge yeah it's it, it's and again at this point <laughs> at this point another thing with lucius he's not he's not been corrupted he's not fallen to chaos like no. he's cut his face a couple of times um, hmm. You know, so there's definitely something mentally unbalanced, but yeah. there's no, you know, uh, possessed sword uh, whispering in his ear. There's no, no uh, Erebus telling him what's what. He he's down on the planet because actually he's been earmarked as someone that's going to be loyal. Yeah, and um, and this is the other thing as well. Like he wants to fight his way back in. Yeah. So he's gone out and killed that chaplain. He could have killed anybody. He's gone out and killed an, a named character. Yeah. Took his head off just so he could get into his box and be like, get the fuck. <laughs> <laughs> he could have take. He could have done it another way, but he just he, he just loves killing. He's as I said, like you know, there's a lot to like about Lucius as a character. <laughs> yeah. There's not a lot to like about him as a person, but the character and the way it's written is 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 very cool. Like he no. is, he is a cool character. You wouldn't let him walk your dog, would you? Well, <laughs> depends what you want to happen to the dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, <But yeah>. oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, all right. 
So shall we <laughs> shall we wrap this one up and then yes. um, uh, we will look forward to the conclusion of Fulgrim on our fifth and final part. Um, we've got some awesome stuff in the, this next one, some disgusting stuff as well, I think. Yep. Um, but for the time being, um, please like, share and subscribe to us. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Come search us out. Um, let us know what you think. Um, and feel free to come and um, talk to us about the book because we'd love to do it. Absolutely. Uh, and for now, we'll say goodbye and see you on episode five. See you on episode five.